Thank you very much for being here today. I appreciate you, and I appreciate the opportunity to spend this time with you. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of this day. It is a gift you have not promised, and we are so grateful for it. Thank you for the beautiful, beautiful weather, for this beautiful event, and gathering these beautiful women to study your word and to strive to go closer to you. And Lord, we pray that our time together will honor you. I pray that our discussion will be pleasing in your eyes. I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide us. Um, I pray that we will be motivated, that you will teach us to number our days, that we might gain a heart and wisdom. And Lord, we ask you to enter into this conversation. We ask you, um, above all else, that when we leave this place, we'll be closer to you than when we came. It's in your precious sense name we pray. Well, as I said, the, our theme is this verse, Psalm 90, verse 12. I want to share with you what ignited my passion, really, about this pursuit. And it started especially in about 2015 when I took a class called Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. Has anybody taken that class? You must. You would love it. You would love it. If you ever have the opportunity, jump online and find it and find a class. It is incredible. It is by far the most life-changing class I've ever taken in my life, and I've talked to students um, who have been to seminary and even said the same thing. Um, it's fantastic. So I took Perspectives. It's a semester-long course, and through the course of that, they asked the question, do you know which country receives the most missionaries? And so I was thinking to myself of the places that I most commonly hear people go and um, just guessing in my mind, you know, where that might be. Well, it turns out, if you, some of you I'm sure know this, but if you don't, the country that receives the most missionaries is the United States of America. We also send the most missionaries. Well, when I heard this information, I thought to myself, that's crazy. And what they said was, there is a perception across the other side of the world. They see the United States falling apart at the seams. Yep. And they say, if we can save them, we can change the world. And so they sent their missionaries here. Mm. And when I heard that, it uncovered in me pride that I didn't know existed because I felt like, why should we have to receive missionaries? We have churches on every corner. Why would we need to have missionaries come here? And it made me feel like if we were doing our job as the church, we wouldn't need missionaries from the other side of the world coming here. And it reali I realized that that pride that was there was not welcome, and I was not okay with it. And I think it was Pastor X, I think, maybe that, that coined this, I'm not entirely sure, but they've used the term satanic lullaby, as if to say that Satan has just lulled us into this sense that everything's okay, that we're just rolling along, or some people call it the slow fade. And I'm not okay with that either. And I thought to myself, what am I doing with my life that we need to have missionaries coming here. And so I started to get very attached to this verse because I thought it's time to get serious about God. And so I started dwelling on this verse, you know, teach me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. It's in the context of Psalm 90, which was actually a prayer written by Moses. They say that they think it's the oldest of the Psalms. They think it was written somewhere about 1440 BC. And it was presumably during the time that the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness. And why were they there? It was because of their unbelief and their rebellion. Does that sound at all familiar? Wandering in the wilderness because of unbelief and rebellion. And so to me, this psalm should speak to all of us. They wrote it, or he wrote it, excuse me, probably for the primary use of people to pray daily in their tents over and over and over again, or perhaps for the priests to pray during their time in the tabernacle. But it does speak to us as we wander through the wilderness today in the darkness. And so I'm going to read Psalm 90 in its entirety because it's within the context of where we find our key verse. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, 
saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass in the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it's dry and withered. We're consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years, or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we've seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And so as we think through that psalm and kind of recap it just a little bit, in the beginning it talks about from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is eternal, right? He's on a different plane than us more finite people here on earth. We people, he says, it says you turn back into dust. We humans have a limited number of days on earth. We are eternal beings, but our time on earth is limited. It says you even see our secret sins. Our lives are short at best and not easy. So teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us with your love. Thank goodness it takes a turn, right? Because it sounds pretty dismal up to that point. And then it turns and it says, satisfy us with your love. May your favor rest upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. In other words, if we don't work with the Holy Spirit, we accomplish nothing. So establish the work of our hands. So if we're asking him to number our days, that we would have a heart of wisdom, we need to know what to do with them. We need to ask him to establish the work of our hands. So let that be our prayer. There's also an echo of this in the New Testament. In the New Testament, in Ephesians 5, 15, 16, it says, Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because days are evil. Similar message, right? The New Testament, as opposed to Moses' message in about 1440 BC, we see the same message coming through. We know the deal. We know the Great Commission. We know what we're supposed to be doing, right? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go, if you've studied the, the Great Commission, I'm sure you have, it may mean go. It also may mean as you are going. As you are going, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Spirit, excuse me, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so I thought to myself, okay, discipleship is my purpose. I'm supposed to be making disciples. And so I set about studying it because I knew that in my life I was deficient in that area, and that's not good if that's my purpose that God has established for me. And so I started studying discipleship. And one of the things that I learned right away haunted me because they said, think of the number of disciples that you've made and that <coughs> disciple doesn't count unless they've made a disciple because after all, multiplication is the goal. And so then I thought, huh, how many disciples have I made that have made disciples? And then I was deeply convicted because I was lacking in that area. So I thought to myself, what am I even doing with my life? If this is my purpose and I'm stymied by that question, what am I doing with my life? 
If you haven't ever heard the sermon by John Piper called Don't Waste Your Life, I encourage you to listen to it. Um, I'm just going to very briefly touch on it because I'm fascinated by it. He talks about a comparison of what he calls a tragedy. So on one hand, there were two elderly ladies who were doing, I believe, medical missions across the world. It's been a lifetime doing it. And they died in an auto accident at an elderly age. Now, he compares that to a couple that he read about in Reader's Digest who were catapulted into early retirement and they got this big beautiful boat and started collecting seashells. And he said, which is the tragedy? These ladies who spent a lifetime of making disciples or the couple who gets early retirement, their dreams come true and they're collecting shells. And he said, at the end of their lives, when they stand before God, what do you think God will say when they say, look at our shells? Look at all our shells. <laughs> and I thought, that means something. Irma Bombeck has a quote that's very similar. It says, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would have not a single bit of talent left and could say, I used everything you gave me. Isn't that what we want? to expend everything that he has given us for his good and for his glory. You know the song Amazing Grace, right? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. There's a verse in there that I love, and it says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Now these two ladies in the back have agreed to be um, helpers for this little visual here. You've probably seen something similar to it, and that's okay, because it never hurts to refresh just a little bit. So, you have a baby, so maybe it'd be best if you took this in. Okay. You get a jump off. He's very happy about this whole prospect. He's like, hello. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. So, if you envision this representing eternity, she, they, would walk and walk and walk forever, right? eternity. So we're not capturing it. We're not capturing it. But we're going to work. Just work with me. <laughs> so I don't want to make her walk too much further. Okay, so how much space on this line should represent your lifetime, do you think? I mean, inches, feet, you. Huh? Yeah. And, and who cares? Right? It's eternity. It doesn't matter. There's no right answer because if this is infinity, we do have a starting point somewhere. We did have a beginning. But we are eternal beings even though our life on this earth does end at some point. So let's just say, for example, this is our lifespan right here. So we start here, and what we do during this time, if we choose to follow Christ, establishes everything else for all of eternity, right? Okay. Also, what we do during this time can influence other people's lives around us for all of eternity. Thank you. You can just lay this down if you would, please. Thank you very much for your help. If you think about this song and you think, wow, I, I don't even, I don't know about you, but I can't even picture what it would be like to be in the presence and the glory of God for eternity. And 10,000 years from now, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first began. I can't even fathom that. It's beautiful. But, what about the rest? What about the ones who spend eternity apart from God? 10,000 years from then, they'll be no closer to being with God than when they first began. And what we know about being apart from God for eternity is not something I would wish on anyone. That should deeply convict us. We want this. There's no one that we want to wish that upon. And so it should change the way we approach our lives. We should be deeply convicted. It's time to get serious about God. We need to be taught to number our days that we might have a heart of wisdom. I looked up more commentaries about this particular verse because sometimes things aren't exactly what they appear to be on the surface. And so I'm gonna get the context and then I look for the commentaries. And it turns out what it means is, teach us to number our days <laughs> so that we can gain a heart of wisdom that we know how to spend them wisely. Act like 
We're finite beings. We don't have forever. And neither do the people around us to establish their infinity. Teach us how to act like Christians who are concerned about the people around us and our own salvation. Have you heard of Dr. Leslie Moorhead's clock? I love this. We're gonna go for it through it quickly, okay. So, basically, really, basically what Dr. Moorhead did was he condensed an average lifetime onto a clock. And so he did it as a visual for us to imagine. So, if you're 15 years old, the time is 10.25 a.m. If you're 20, it's 11.34. If you're 25, it's 12.42. If you're 30, it's 1.51. If you're 35, the time is 3 p.m. If you're 40, it's 4.08. At 45, it's 5.15. If you're 50, it's 6.25. By 55, the time is 7.24. <coughs> if you're 60, the time is 8.42. If you're 65, the time is 9.51. And if you're 70, the time is 11 p.m. For my parents, it's midnight. For me, it's 7.24. Do you know how much I accomplished after 7.24 in the evening? <laughs> Do you even know what happens in my I mean, not much. Because by then I'm tired. <laughs> and I think to myself, I don't have time to be tired. And you, if there are young moms in the room, you have from approximately lunch to dinner time, to shape those little arrows in your quiver. Don't take a nap. It's very easy to miss it. And those little arrows that you're shaping are gonna reach places that you could not reach by yourself. And we're gonna talk more about that because that's also not easy. So, Ecclesiastes 11.6 says, Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let your hands not be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. You don't know how God's going to use the things that you're doing. So take a risk and go do something. It may be seeming like the smallest thing, or it may seem like something enormous. You don't know how God's going to use it for his kingdom. But go do something. Take a risk and go do something. Sow your seed in the morning and even let your hands not be idle. In the evening, that's me. Don't let my hands be idle for I don't know what he's gonna do with my life from this point moving forward from what I have left. So what to do? So I wanted to learn more about numbering my days and how to use them wisely and what to do. And so I learned something really, really valuable. And this is open for discussion because it's not a quote from the Bible, okay? This comes from an organization that I love. Um, it's called movement.org. I've learned so much from them about community development and about how to spread the gospel across the world. And it was during one of their presentations that I heard this. And so as soon as I heard it, it captured my attention. And I think it will yours too. The health of the church, and this is probably paraphrased, the health of the church is not measured by the number of people in the pews, but in the health of the community. What do you think? You agree? Yeah? Even though that's not easy, right? So I had this aha moment making this connection because I thought, no wonder. It's love God, love people if we do those things. If we're loving God and we're loving people, then our communities ought to be healthier, right? So I thought, okay, well, if our community should be healthy, let's take a look. In our community, and I want to preface this before I bring these things up to you because one, I love my community. I've lived my whole entire life. I love the people there. I love the community. We do have some <laughs> issues. <laughs> if you were looking at your community assessment, what are some of the issues you think would pop up in your community assessment? Just anything. Drugs. Homelessness. Drugs. Homelessness. Crime. Crime. Drug abuse. I'm sorry? Drug abuse. Drug abuse, absolutely. Yeah, it's not hard to think of things, right? Okay. Well, in our community, we have a very formal community assessment every three years. And so the information I'm going to share with you is the most recent that we have access to right now. It's a 21 assessment, which means that the data that, it was, that was collected happened prior to COVID for the most part, or at least in part, so like the 18-19 period of time, so that it can be published in 21, okay? 
And that's important because as we begin to look at this, I want you to see um, what happens in this, there's an 85 page summary. So I've just captured just a few of the highlights, okay, to share with you. I know you can't read this, it goes against all PowerPoint rules. I'm gonna read it to you, don't panic. Okay, our community ranked highest in low income students by district. We had the highest dropout rate, it was double other districts in the state. Highest rate of chronically truant students. Poorest graduation rate, poorest percent of ninth graders on track to graduate. 67% of third graders were not meeting expectations in math proficiency. 71.3% of our third graders were not meeting expectations in language proficiency. We had the poorest proficient in science assessment. 4.14 physical health days in the past 30 days. 4.54 mental health days in the past 30 days. 14% reported more frequent mental illness prior to COVID. Increased amount of depression in youth, higher percentages of bullying. We see 38% of adults are obese. 27% were physically inactive prior to COVID. And therefore, of course, we see increased diagnoses of diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. We see increased drug arrests, juvenile detention admissions, and an increased number of children in substitute care. We see an increase in video gaming licenses, just to capture the essence of an 85-page report, 85-page summary at that. So our community does not look very healthy. Our indicators are moving in the wrong direction. And I love our community, but we have work to do. So do you know what was not there in the 85-page summary? The church not a mention not a mention of faith not a mention of religion not a mention of church nothing even when they were asked an open-ended question to say what do you think are the top three things currently helping to improve the quality of life of our residents they could say anything but they didn't say the church they're not looking to us they don't see us as helpful they don't see us as making an impact on the quality of life in the community it's time to get serious about God. It's time to get serious about loving his people. And especially, I wanted to point out to you, one of the indicators that said 71.3% of our kids were not proficient at third grade reading level. Do we have educators in the room? Educators? Okay. So what they teach us in community health, and you guys can disagree because I respect your opinions, we're in slightly different disciplines here. What they teach us in community health is third grade reading level is extremely important because up to third grade, you're learning to read. And from third grade on, you're reading to learn. And if you don't have it, you're in trouble. You are much more likely to struggle through school. You are much more likely to drop out. You are much less likely to be fit for service. You are much more likely to end up in juvenile detention and far more likely to end up in prison. Agree or disagree? Agree? Okay. Some people say that they even utilize the third grade reading level to predict the number of prison cells that are needed. If you research that, they'll say, well, not actually, but it's a pretty good indicator. <laughs> so is that an actual score that they utilize? Maybe not, but most people agree it's a strong indicator. So if the people in our church are capable of reading at a third grade reading level, why aren't we teaching children how to read? We can do that, right? That's easy to, it's not easy to teach, but it's something to wrap our arms around and say, let's tackle that. Because if we did that, we've impacted 71.3% of our children in the community by just that one indicator. And what a difference that would make in not only their lives, but in the life of our community. And so, I was taking students out in my last job, and my, my responsibility was to expose them to all these areas of community health, because they only get one semester to do community health. And so every week we go to a different place, and every week we'd come back together in post-conference, and we would talk about what we saw. And every week we were talking about this stuff, all the brokenness, and then the next week we'd pick up and go somewhere else. And that started to wear on me as a Christian, because I felt like I was looking in from a fishbowl and to see what was going on in the brokenness and not respond to it was not okay with me. And so I'm extremely blessed to be in the position where I am now, working 
at a soup kitchen and, and food pantry because I get to be boots on the ground again and I get to receive students, which is amazing. The students I used to take out, I now receive, which is, is great because I love the students and I miss them. But I love being able to introduce them to what community health really looks like. And so I have this opportunity to walk with the richest of the rich who come to serve and the poorest of the poor who come for a meal and all these volunteers in between and people that come that serve for community service hours because they're on probation and everyone comes. And so when we're sitting around the table at Bible study, you don't know if it's a volunteer or a staff member or a guest and it doesn't matter because we're all a broken mess in need of a savior who need to take one more step. That's what the church should look like, right? That's what the church should look like. And I learned that all poverty is spiritual poverty. And when I first heard that, I thought, ah, I don't know about that. I'm not sure. All spiritual poverty. I don't know about that. But over time, I've learned to believe that's true because it's much less about material insufficiency and much more about feeling ashamed or hopeless or helpless or disconnected. Because if you talk to someone who's living in material poverty, there's a very good chance they're not going to talk about being unable to pay their utility bill. They might mention it, might get a mention, but more likely they're going to talk about how helpless they feel, how they don't have anyone, how they're on their own and no one cares, and they feel very hopeless about <coughs> the future. So Chalmers is another organization that I absolutely love. Chalmers and others say this, that after the fall, we all experience broken relationships between ourselves and God, others, and creation, and ourselves. God, self, others, and creation. Okay? I don't think there's any disagreeing about that, right? Because since the fall, we all experience those things. And so it's been my desire to try to walk alongside our guests and my new friends to try to restore those relationships. I wanted to share just a couple of stories with you because I think they illustrate so beautifully how this works in terms of them demonstrating this helplessness, hopelessness, and how we have the keys to the kingdom because we have Jesus Christ. We have that to give them. We have the hope that they're looking for. They just don't know it. One day, um, one of our guests had come in and we had just gone for a walk. Um, I was actually taken to another organization to make a referral, but I walk with her because if you just make the referral, they won't go. So we're walking down the street, and because she was so hopeless and feeling so helpless, I thought I'm going to try to put her mind in a different place. And so I said, okay, queen for the day scenario. If you could spend your day any way you wanted to, how would you spend it? And she walked for a little while, and then she said, And then she walked for a little while longer, and then she said, I don't think you understand. She said, I've been trafficked since I was four years old, and I've always been whoever they told me I was. I don't even know. And I said, what's your favorite food? Because her birthday was coming up. And she said, I don't know. She's not going to the store thinking to herself, what sounds good tonight, chicken? She just passively walks in and sits down in her hopeless state and just waits for somebody to bring her a meal or for her to pick up her own. And she had a really hard time to try to figure out what her favorite meal was because she hadn't thought about that. And no one had asked her because nobody cared. So in the course of the conversation, she turned around and she looked at me and she said, how would you respond to that question? And I really couldn't hardly do it because the things that I thought of were, well, I spent the day with my family and I'd fix our favorite food and I'd spend some time with our animals and we'd just enjoy our time together. That would be a really great day. But I couldn't hardly choke that out because she had none of those things. She had no family. She didn't even know what her favorite foods were if you gave her the option because she hadn't thought of that. Nobody cared. She didn't even care. She wasn't going to be spending a day like that. And so it made me realize that I had a desperate desire to help her figure out who is in there 
Because God created her in his image, and there's someone in there that needs to be unleashed and to have hope again and to have their life reconciled and restored. And that's where the church comes in, right? Because we have the keys to the kingdom. She didn't know she needed a savior. She just knew things weren't good like they were. I had another lady that came in, and she was battling an addiction. And so she was telling her her situation. And in her situation, she was about to be evicted. She lived with her grandma. She had a little baby. And the only food they had access to was the meal that was delivered to her grandma. And so they all three shared it. And she gave her grandma and the baby the food first, and if there was anything left, then she would eat it. She had had broken relationships with both men and women, and she had this little baby that they were trying to take from her because they felt she was unfit as a mother. And so she knew she was on the verge of being hopeless, or excuse me, homeless. She couldn't pay any utilities, and she couldn't pay rent. And so she came to me desperate for help. And so when, when you're doing this type of service, you think, okay, where do we even start? So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, you obviously have to have a place to live, and you have to have food on your table. Let's start there, you know, it's in my mind. But I asked her, I said, what's the most important thing to you? And she just broke down and started sobbing. And she said, the hardest part for me is my little boy is about to turn one year old, and I can't give him the party I promised. <coughs> she said, every kid should be able to look back at their first birthday and have pictures of them with their smash cake, and I can't do that for him. And I really feel like I've completely let him down. No wonder they're trying to take him from me. Well, at the time, it cost $80-ish, I found, <coughs> to have a party at McDonald's, which was their dream, for him and eight of his closest friends. And so, as a church, that's a pretty doable thing, $80 party for eight little ones. And so we had a party. And it turns out that when we had the party, some of the people who came were like, wow, I think the church actually does care. And someone actually came to our church and tried it out. And then her text after church was, thanks for taking me with you to church. I loved it. And nobody even looked at me crazy like. That was her text. <laughs> so it was so important to realize, you know, she knew how to be homeless. That wasn't the most important thing to her. She was, she, not that she wasn't concerned, but she knew how to do that. She'd been there before. She was concerned because she couldn't give her little boy his first birthday party. And she taught me a lot about resilience. Because if you ever study much about trauma healing, the whole goal is to teach people resilience. And I thought, that is the biggest joke I've ever seen in my life. Like, I could teach her resilience. I know nothing about resilience. And she knows everything about what to teach me about resilience. So I thought, do I have resilience? Does the church, do we? Do we have resilience? So what's our future look like? I'm going to make some broad stroke generalizations here, but in general, the next generation does not want to be sitting in pews. In general, my generation of churchgoers loves to study the Bible, and we love to worship together, but we're not great at taking it out into the streets. The next generation, they don't really necessarily want to study the Bible. They want to be out because they are very concerned about making a difference in the world around them. So I thought to myself, wouldn't it be swell if we could learn from each other <laughs> and do both? Wouldn't that be amazing? And in the future, if they don't want to be sitting in a pew, what does that look like for the church? And then I thought, COVID. That forced us to say, you're not going to be meeting like this. And I don't know what God's up to, but it makes me wonder if maybe he's preparing us for a different kind of church in the future. Maybe it looks more like the early church. Because what they would do is they would assess their community, and if they found people who didn't know the Lord, they would go to them. The expectation was not that they came to the church. They took the church to the people who needed to know about the Lord. And so maybe the way is being paved for something that looks more like that. It's almost like they left the 99 to get the one, right? So it's all about loving others and living it out. And so I realized 
as I developed in this role, that my past attempts to invite people to church looked like this. I would say, you know, if I saw something that I knew was unchurched, I would invite them and say, hey, you want to come to church with me? And then usually they'd say yes or make some excuse or something like that, but they generally didn't come. Or sometimes they'd come, but then they usually didn't come back. And so I thought, I invited them. It's on them. They decide not to come. What am I supposed to do? Until I met my colleagues. <laughs> and my colleagues taught me what to do. Because what they do is they invite somebody to church, and then they say, I'll be there to pick you up at 845. And then when they get there, and they're not standing at the curb, and they're not dressed, and they're not ready, they wait and say, this is the deal. You said you were going. I'll wait for you. Get your clothes on. Let's go. And they do. And then they go to church. And then after church, it's time for lunch. And they need something to eat. And so you take them to lunch. And then whilst you have the car, <laughs> could we swing by here and there and do these errands on the way? Because otherwise, there's no transportation. And so then you take them home, and it turns into a whole day of investment in their lives, and it works. They're baptizing people left and right. I'm saying, I asked, and they decided not to come. So I've learned a lot <laughs> about the error of my ways. <laughs> but I've had to ask myself, am I willing to do those things? Am I willing to do those things? Am I willing to do what it takes to long for their salvation more than they do? Because they don't even know they need a Savior yet. I have to want it more than they do right now. Until they can come alongside somebody who acts like Jesus in their life, who accepts them for who they are and walks alongside them and picks them up and take, takes them to lunch and gets them the things that they need and takes them home until they realize on their own, when they hit rock bottom usually, that this isn't working, they need a savior. And they realize, I'm not the one you need. <laughs> I'm just here in his stead until I can introduce you to my savior. And that's powerful. So, this verse struck me in Proverbs that says, do not withhold good to those to whom it is due when it is within your power to act. And there are a lot of things that are within my power to act. And Proverbs tells me I'm not to withhold it if it's within my power to act. And I realize it's time to get serious about God. That means surrendering it all. And I wondered, am I willing to give up my so-called hopes and dreams for the sake of the gospel. My husband had a dream. His dream was to be a park ranger and live by himself in the woods. Well, then he decided maybe it'd be okay to get married. <coughs> but if he was going to get married, it was going to be somebody tall, blonde, and athletic. <laughs> and in case you're wondering, I'm not athletic either. <laughs> but it worked out. It's all good. We both realized, even though we grew up in the church, we both realized at the same time that we were missing something that there was more to being a follower of Jesus than just showing up at church on Sunday morning and then going back to Monday as if nothing ever happened. And now it's more of a common conversation. And we start to look at our th ourselves and say, what are we gonna do with our time and our energy and our resources? Because after all, it's 7.24 p.m. <laughs> at best, we don't have a lot of time. Teach us to number our days that we might have a heart of wisdom. And then we look at our stuff and say, should we have this stuff? if we're not using it for the kingdom or is there a way we can use this stuff for the kingdom or what are we even doing? Bob Goff in his study called Undistracted, he has this book that I love and it's Be Where Your Feet Are. And I love that because if you think about it, how often are we not fully present right where we are in the moment with what God has right in front of our very eyes? The people around us who have not experienced our Savior. Be fully present. Be where your feet are. It's not, it's not that complicated. And am I willing to be the light in the darkness that is our world, or am I going to be, as one commentary said it, and it stuck with me, invisible light? What's the point <coughs> of invisible light? I don't want to be invisible light. So, I know I can't do this on my own. It's only through God's power. And he has designed us for such a time as this. He, I used to think I was misplaced because I thought I belonged in a time with hoop skirts and horses and carriages. 
But since then, I've realized, no, actually, he's very intentional about where he puts us and when. And he's designed me, and he's designed you for this very moment in time. And I can't think of a worse time in our culture than right now. So do you understand the gravity of the calling that we have, that he would entrust this to us? And I think, what are you thinking? <laughs> because apparently, I have some shortfalls here. Look at the community, look at the things around me. And he's opening my eyes more and more, but when I think about the fact that he has put us here for such a time as this, I think, wow, that's a huge, weighty responsibility. There's work to be done. I had a chance to go to Myanmar, which is one of the poorest places in the world. Um, beautiful, beautiful people. And while we were there, our host, who is native to their land, was taking us through the city out into the country. And as we're passing through the city, we went by a golf course. And so one of the guys that was with us says to our host, is that a good golf course? He's lived there his whole life. He says, never been. Too many lost souls. And I'll never forget that comment because I don't play golf, but I have my own issues. And it made me start to think, here's a guy who's like a modern day Paul. He's been beaten, he's been imprisoned, his family's been threatened, and he is living out every minute for the sake of the gospel. He's not taking time for golf because there are too many lost souls. And I'm like, I want that. I want to look like that. And their students, their students, during rainy season, they would have to walk in thigh high water to their bamboo huts for class. And I have worked with college students just enough to know that my college students would have said, class is canceled. And I probably would have said, yep, <laughs> like snow day, but not there. And so I asked the students, I said, what do you think about when the waters are thigh high and you have to walk through it? And they said, we're grateful because when the waters rise, there are fish that we get to eat for free. And their gratitude was so beautiful. They would just scoop the fish up. And then they would have food for free. And I thought to myself, I want that. I want that kind of desire to learn about the Lord, to be willing to walk through thigh high water, to get to a bamboo hut to study, to be able to spread the gospel into the far outer reaches of the earth. So after perspectives, I was on fire, and I just wanted to drop everything, and I wanted to do whatever he wanted me to do, and go wherever he wanted me to do, and I wanted my family to do that too. And I don't know about you, my family didn't take the class with me. Have you ever been to maybe say a conference, and then you go home because you're all excited, you're on fire, and you're trying to communicate to somebody, and they're not getting it? It was like that. So I'm all on fire, I'm like I'm looking for some place to take all of us to go, and they'll put me on a mission together, we're gonna spend the rest of our lives as missionaries, and it felt flat, nothing. So, I learned some things through that too because, I mean, those of you who have children, don't you want the same thing? I mean, you want your kids to be sold out for Christ, right? You want that. That's why you're parenting as Christians. And then I thought, or, or do we? Um, and I read this book. Actually, I only read part of it because I had stopped when I got to this part. It's called My Heart in His Hands by Ann Judson. So, her husband was preparing to be a missionary and he was writing this letter to ask permission of her parents to marry him and take her with him on mission. So th this is what he wrote. He said, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure for a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, 
Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise which shall redound with our Savior from the heathen unsa- that are saved through her means from eternal woe and despair? And when I read that, I thought, actually, I'm not really sure I do want that. <laughs> because what might he ask them to do? And then I started to question, am I really on fire as much as I thought? Because what if he sends my children and he doesn't send me? It's costly when you get serious about God. And I've learned a lot, but I'm definitely not an expert. <coughs> Something's gone terribly wrong, and this is spiritual warfare. Our battle is not against the flesh and blood. 2 Timothy 2.4 says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Did you see War Room, the movie? Mm -hmm. Do you remember when they rolled out the map, and they saw the enemy encroaching, and so they made a plan, right? It does not work to see the enemy encroaching and say, well, that's unfortunate. What are we going to do about that? So... What's our plan as the church? The enemy has a plan, I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. And we have to have a plan too. And if you're wondering what it is, God gave it to us. And it goes something like, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love others. So love them enough to go and make disciples and teach them everything he's commanded us. It may be daunting, but if we think about just doing for the man what you wish you could do for the masses, just the one. In our community, we have about 40,000 people, a little less now, and about 10,000 people prior to COVID were in attendance at a church at some point in time. That's a ratio that seems doable. If I live in a community for a lifetime and 10,000 people are in church on a given Sunday and we have 40,000 people in the community, all I have to do is reach three or four people in a lifetime that seems like it should be doable, <laughs> right? Seems like that should be doable. The world is in desperate need of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 3, 1 through 3, this is a letter to Sardis, and you know how in Revelation he's, he's pulling out the good, bad, and the ugly, right? So in his letter to Sardis, he says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will, know, will not know at what time I will come to you. <coughs> and the commentaries say, wake up. Start paying attention to others' needs for salvation and stop being careless about their heart's condition before God. If you will not, I will come against you. But if you pay attention, you will be found worthy. And they define worthy as matching the profession of your mouth, of your faith, to the deeds of your heart. You're worthy if you profess to love the Lord and you're doing something to bring other people to know him because you have the keys to the kingdom. So, it's time to get serious about God. And I would just pray that he would teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, there's so much beauty in the world and there's so much work to be done. And God, my prayer is that you will touch the heart and the mind of every single one of us here tonight and inspire us to do great things for the sake of the gospel to just take a risk and to go out and do something. Because we don't know how you'll use it, whether this or that will be used for the greater or maybe both, but something. Help us not to be complacent. Help us not to be captive to a satanic lullaby. Help us to respond to your call to go and make disciples, to be your ambassadors as though you were making the plea for reconciliation through us yourself. Write it on our hearts, Lord. Give us the passion and the desire 
unleash the power of your church through these ladies. God, no matter how great or small the incident seems to be, God, we just pray that you'll use every single one of us, that you will teach us to number our days, that we would have a heart of wisdom. And God, our deep desire is that when we leave this place, we'll be closer to you than when we came. It's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen.